Good morning. Good morning. Let's bow in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father God, Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thankful for your holy word, your holy spirit. We're thankful for your son and his great sacrifice. We're thankful for you, Father God. Lord, be with us this day. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to receive your word. Father God, be with me. Remove me. And allow your word to speak. Forgive me of my sin. Do not let my sin uh, be a barrier for your word to come out in its purest and most concentrated form Amen. for all of us, Father God, that we may glean and take in your word, Father God, and Amen. be drawn closer to you, Father. I pray that your word and your spirit, Father God, find lodgment this day in our hearts. So, Father God, we thank you, we love you, and we need you. In the great name of Jesus, amen. Amen. <clears throat> I want to thank our minister, Dr. Sahili, as well as our dear brother, Carlos Jackson, for allowing me this opportunity. Uh, to speak to you today. So I know that this text is very familiar with Jesus walking on water. Um, so this story is recorded in Matthew. It's recorded in the book of Mark. It's also recorded in the book of John. But in my opinion, M Matthew had more detail for me to pull from. Now, there, are, there is some stuff in Mark that's not in Matthew. Amen. There's also some stuff in John that's not in Mark or Matthew. Amen. So to see the totality of the picture, you've got to dig into all three of those. Um, and so I'll just tell you, wow, almost to the day a month ago, my wife and I had to bury our uncle. And in preparing for that, um, I was asked to do the eulogy. Now, I had never done a eulogy before. So when my brother reached out, I said, hey, man, pray for me. Because I, I don't take this lightly. And I want to make sure I'm led by God's spirit. So in sitting down with our uncle's children, I asked them and said, hey, what, what do you think he would want preached? He's got six children. I think my wife and I was at the table with five of them. And almost simultaneously, they all said, well, what about his favorite scripture? I said, well, what is that? And it was this text. Yeah. I said, praise God, because I didn't know where to go. Amen. So in preparing for that, I did what our brother Carlos said and went back to this text with fresh eyes to see what God had for us. And I'm so thankful for that that opportunity. So now let's just set this up, right? So at the top of the text, at the top of this chapter, it's about John the Baptist being beheaded. Right. So John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus. Right. So then Jesus hears that his cousin has just been murdered through John's disciples. They run and tell Jesus what just happened to his cousin. So then Jesus departs to be alone. Now, he's 100% man. He's 100% God. But just like you and I, he got to grieve too. Right, man. So he separated himself because of the news he just heard. Yeah, right. He was also very popular already. So people were always looking for him and seeking him out and following him. So as he departed by boat, there was people who heard where he was and where he was headed. So they followed him on foot out of cities to meet him where he was at. And so Jesus saw them once he got there and had compassion on them. Mm -hmm. Now he's going to be alone to grieve. But he sees these lost people. Come on. And he had compassion on them. Amen. And the Bible says he went ahead and started to heal mm -hmm. those people. Amen. Although he's trying to grieve, he starts to heal Amen. these people. Oh, come on, preachers. Yeah, yeah. So he begins to heal these people, and this is where we get into the feeding of the 5,000. Mm -hmm. 
because it says he went to a desert place. Well, they met him in that desert place, and the disciples was like, hey, it's about that time to send them back because it's getting dark and we ain't got no food. Amen. They didn't know they was talking to the bread of life. Amen. So Jesus said, man, get them something to eat. All we got is five loaves, two fish. I heard one preacher call that a tuna fish sandwich. That's all we got. And Jesus said, man, sit him down. Bring me. Oh, there's something right there. Bring me what you have. Amen. That's like when people say, I ain't ready to come to Christ yet. Let me get myself together. Bring me what you have. I can work with where you are. Bring me the scraps that you got. What somebody else would consider scraps, bring it to me. Jesus looked up, blessed it, break, and fed 5,000 plus. Mm -hmm. The 5,000 is the men. Those men had families. Right. Some may say he fed 10 to 15,000 people. Right. So now when the people saw this, now this is in John 6. John 6 says that the people saw what he did with the tuna fish sandwich <laughs> and said, this must be the one. This is the prophet we've been waiting on. Let's take him by force and erect him as our king. Now, Jesus perceived what they were thinking and said, no, nah, playboy, it's not my time yet. I'm not on your timeline. That's where we're going to pick up in verse 22. Because when Jesus perceived they were trying to take him by force, he said to his disciples, get in the boat, I'll meet you across the road, and let me send them away. Right, right. That's where we meet in verse 22. Because I was wondering, why did he immediately force them to get in the boat and leave? Well, because the people was going to take Jesus by force and try to erect him as a king. And he's like, not yet. Matter of fact, Peter, all y'all, get. I'll meet y'all on the other side. Let me send them away, and I'll meet you over there. Verse 22, and straightway, Jesus constrained, forced his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. So let me just make this point real quick. <laughs> if the savior of the world had time to set himself apart and separate himself from people to go spend a long time with God, if the savior of the world had time, how dare I make the excuse that I don't have time? The son of God, the creator of the world, dealing with the doubt of his disciples, right. dealing with the hypocrisy of Pharisees, right. dealing with all he was dealing with, saving the world, preparing himself to be killed, yet and still found time to spend alone with God. Amen. What excuse do I have? Verse 24. Here we go. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. When it says the ship was tossed, another word for tossed right there is torture. That ship was being tortured by the waves. It was being beat against with the waves. Remember when Paul was talking about, hey, I've been shipwrecked. He'd been dealing with water. The waves is beating on this ship. How do you think these boys are feeling in this boat? He just read. It's like 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm sure it's pitch black. And these waves are beating against this ship. It says the wind was contrary. The wind was in opposition to the way they were going. So they're trying to go this way. And the waves saying, nope. They're trying to go this way. Even if they try to stand up, the wind is waiting on them to knock them back down. Right. What are you saying, Charles? They were stuck in the position they were in. Right. 
being rocked and tossed back and forth with no hope. Jesus is on the shore. (laughs) It's 3 o'clock in the morning. You ever been tossing and turning in your bed at 3 o'clock in the morning? Let me help you. Spiritual application. You ever been rocking back and forth, being tortured by your thoughts at 3 o'clock in the morning, and it's just you? Even if your spouse is laying next to you, you are dealing with whatever is going on in your mind. Check this out. This is not about, can I physically walk on water? Wait till we get there. Peter and the boys are stuck in a tough situation. They don't know which way to go, where to look, where is the relief? Have you ever felt like that? God, what is going on? And check this out. God, Jesus told them to go. Jesus said, get in the boat and go. Now I'm in the middle of this lake and I feel like I'm about to die. Why did you send me here? Ah, hello, preachers. Why did you send me here? Just for me to be caught up in this struggle. It's not over yet. Verse 25. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, Walking on the sea. I'm trying to paint the picture. They're being tossed. They're already scared. They're feeling stuck. There's no relief. What are we going to do? And here comes an image doing, defying the laws of gravity. Right, man. Right. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they're already scared. But now they see what they think is a ghost walking on the sea. They were troubled, saying, it is a spirit, meaning it is a ghost, and cried out for fear. I've cried out for fear before in the middle of the night because I don't know what the result of whatever I'm dealing with is going to be. So I'm crying out, God, Please help me just get through the night. Please show me some favor. Please help me understand what this is. Crying out in fear. Because I don't know. I don't know where this is going to lead me. Watch what Jesus does. But straightway, or immediately, Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. Have courage. It is I. Be not afraid. It is I is the most powerful words in this text. It's the most comforting words in this text. You know what this is equivalent to? This is equivalent to when God told Moses, tell them I am that I am sent you. So when Jesus said, it is I, what? I created this water. I created this wind. I am he who you've been waiting on. I'm here. (laughs) Where is Jesus at in your life? There's no need to fear if he is there. Is he here? This is what he's telling these boys. It is I. I'm here. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the Son of God. I am the creator of the world. I came here personally to save you. I am here. Be of good cheer. Problem is we don't understand what's happening in life, and we want clarification. Tell me, Jesus. If he told us, then where would our faith begin? These boys are troubled. Jesus sees that. Chill out, Herb. I got it. I'm here. We're not there yet. It's still not about walking on water. 
And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. You know what Peter just said? Stay with me. Three in the morning. Waves. Wind. Nowhere to go. Pitch black. Feeling stuck. Along comes a ghost. The ghost has a familiar voice. The ghost says, it is I. I got it. Be of good cheer. I'm the one you believe in. I am the one. Then Peter says, Lord, that, that sounds familiar. Why, why would Peter call a, a ghost Lord? Oh, that reminds me of John. My sheep know my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So even though the picture is not clear to Peter yet, he says, wait a minute, I recognize that voice. Lord! <laughs> Peter has a relationship with Jesus. He's used to listening to Jesus. They don't hear me. He's used to listening to Jesus. So when that ghost spoke, Peter said, wait a minute. I know him. I got a relationship with him. I dropped my livelihood and left my family to follow him. Lord. Now, I don't quite, I can't make out if that's really you in this darkness, but if it is. Oh, man. Here's, I had to make an important decision a couple of weeks ago. I've been praying on it. Talking to my wife about it, praying on it, weighing the pros and cons of it. And I told my wife one night, I said, man, I wish God would just talk to us straight up and just say, do this, don't do that. <laughs> ah, he who has found a wife finds a good thing. You know what she said, Brother Her? She said, he already talks to us and we don't even do it. I was lightweight offended. What do you mean he? Then I had to think, oh, oh, we got a whole book. We got a, so I heard another preacher say one time, he was dealing with people in the church and said, you know, people ask me all the time, what does God sound like? How do we know it's God talking to us? Here's what, here's what he said. He said, God sounds like what he wrote. Let me, help, let me help you with that. Let me help you with that. If you are familiar with the text, if you are familiar with the mind of God, if you are familiar with the thinking of God, then you know when you're in certain situations, mm, God may not want me to do that. Well, how did you know? I have historical proof. Well, what does he sound like? Read his text. Watch this. You have, my grandmother died years ago. But I had spent so much time with her that I knew how she would respond to something I was doing or thinking. Amen. Amen. I'm sure we all got family members we can think about who are not physically here anymore, who are not audibly speaking in our ear, but we can think, I wonder what my grandma would say about this. But because I'm familiar with her line of thinking, I know what she would say about this. Apply the same principle to the word of God. Well, what does God sound like? What he wrote? Well, what did he write? Read it. That's what I said when I heard, simple as that. He sounded like what he wrote. Peter said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me. First of all, Lord is a, Lord, Lord is a title. So he's saying, Peter, based on my relationship with Jesus, in that relationship, he's my Lord. He's my master. He's my owner. He's my 
controller. He's my authoritarian. So, master, if that's you, I hear the voice. I can't make out the image. But if that's you, master, I do whatever you tell me to do. Now, if it's you, give me the commandment. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Ah. Peter is a fisherman by trade. He has spent a lot of time in boats on water. I'm sure he's one of those people that, that knows the current, looking at the weather, and I'm sure he understands if I step out of here, I can possibly die. With this current that's going on, if I step out of here, I'll probably die. But master, if you give the commandment, I'm gonna risk my ooh, I'm gonna risk my life. Oh my goodness, what is faith? If you always want to be comfortable, then what is faith for? Right. Peter says, hey, based on our relationship, Jesus, master teacher, if you give the command, oh, I will step out this boat. Mm. I will step out this boat. When he says bid, that's a strong word, Brother Herb. Brother Herb likes words. <laughs> bid is a strong word. Bid is a command. Bid is a urging Bid will incite you to action. Following commandments will accelerate your growth and development if I follow the commandment. Right, so he says, he pretty much says, if you speak, I automatically, it will stir something up in me. I will not be able to resist if you say it. Where is your relationship at with the Father and with the Son to where when he speaks, I don't have a choice anymore? Right. That's what it means by deny yourself. Amen. I told you this ain't about water. Come on. Come on. Make me do it. <laughs> if you say it, I don't have a Make me do it. If it's you, because I trust you, I know you will not send me to my death. I know that. So now, if you say it, I will do it. Amen. You know what's another word for bid? Spur. You know what a spur is? I ain't talking about San Antonio. <laughs> Cowboys yeah. on their boots got this spur on the back, that little metal thing. Uh-huh. And when they're ready to get up out of there in a hurry, they press that spur into the horse's side. And the horse, mm, I'm ready. Right. Oh, my goodness. When the, the cowboy puts that spur in there, that horse comes to attention, and based on the direction of that spur and how much pressure is, he's not trying to hurt the horse. Right. He's getting his attention. All right. How much pressure is applied, he takes off. Yes. He's saying, Master, put your spur, oh my goodness, and they were pricked at the heart. Put your spur in me so I can take off at your every command. Amen. Where is your relationship at? Amen. That horse ain't worried about nobody else but the one that's riding it. And when he feels that spur, I'm gone. You ever heard, you know, horses wear blinders. I can't see nothing else. But when my master gives the command, I'm out. Amen. Spur is defined. To push forward with a pointed object. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. <laughs> the word of God yeah. is quick yeah. and powerful yeah. and sharper. Yeah. He ain't trying to kill us. Right. He's a surgeon. Right. Poke. <laughs> Brother Miles, I need your attention. <sighs> so that I will respond, follow his command, yeah. which is better for me anyway. Yeah. So Peter said, Jesus, poke me. Apply a little pressure. Help me understand that it's you, because I'm not quite sure. But help me understand that it's you. Just apply a little bit of pressure. And I'm, oh, and I'm going. (laughs) I heard somebody say, comfort 
and convenience is the enemy of progress. What is my faith for if I'm good, baby? Good work, good work. Come on, brother. Jesus said one word. In this whole scene, I'm trying to paint the picture. He told him who he was. Peter responds. And then Jesus said, okay, Peter, you want to put me to the test? He didn't preach an hour-long sermon like we do to try to get God's people to understand. He said, come. He said it three chapters ago. In chapter 11, he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He already said this. But now Peter said, if you say it, I won't have a choice. I'll be activated. Your word will activate me. Right. Even if I try to stop my leg, it won't stop. Because your word does that to me. Oh, what kind of relationship do you have with the word of God? To where he can just say, move. Right. Or maybe he has to go. Yeah. <sighs> he told them boys, go out into the world. Don't spend all your time on these nice red pews. Move. Go. He told Peter, though, hey, playboy, come. Yeah. Something happened to Peter right there. This is where, what's that? I connected with Peter right here. Find your text. Find yourself in the text. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Yeah. Whenever this text is brought up, people talk about Jesus walking on the water. Come on now. Right. Peter's a man like you and me. Right. It's true. He ain't got no business walking on this water. <laughs> Amen. This is what blew my mind. He, what Peter did too? Right. I know it's been there the whole time. I must have missed it. But that's what I t my wife's a witness. I said, you know, Peter also walked on the water. Right. And she said, I know. I must have missed that one. <laughs> Watch this, but there's more to it. Sahili, that word walked, heard, that means more than physical. Watch this. Walked means to be devoted, to be an admirer, and a zealous worshiper. A staunch believer and follower. It's in true worship, true devotion. Remember when Jesus told that woman at the well? He told her, a day is coming where it don't matter whether you're in Jerusalem or on this mountain to worship. Because the true worshiper will worship in spirit and in truth. So another way to read this text is Peter worshipped on the water. Uh, obedience to God is worship. If I'm being obedient, I am worshiping God. I don't got to sit next to you and sing to worship God. <laughs> it is not. The Father seeketh such to worship him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I be honest? Yeah. I preached last week in Pittsburgh about religion versus relationship. <laughs> this order of service, this is religion. Right. Uh -huh. hmm. We're offering worship to God, but we lit, we're meeting at a certain time. We have a start time. We have a, a set of acts that we do within. This is religion. However, Peter, this is a relationship. Peter is worshiping at 3 o'clock in the morning, walking on water to Jesus in obedience. 
Where's your relationship with God? He told us a long time ago, he don't care. The Pharisees were very religious. He made it clear what he thought about them. Let us not follow in their footsteps. What's the relationship that you have with the Son of God and his word? <laughs> if I'm obedient all the time, then guess what? I'm in worship all the time. So when I get here, it even goes to the next level. But however, in my personal understanding, obedience to God is just like walking on water. That's what this text is saying. It's not saying go out to Lake Merritt and try to walk. <laughs> Watch this. Peter. <laughs> what made Peter get out the boat? It was the word of God. Peter's trust, his hope is in the word of God. His trust and his hope and his faith is not in the water. He's not wondering, will this water hold my weight? That's not what he's wondering. He said, if you tell me, I will step out on your word. I am standing on your word, not this water. So what do you stand on? Oh. There is a, there's a rap song out called, I Stand On That. E-40, T.I., Joyner Lucas. All of them are talking about their morals, their principles, their standards, and the things they stand on, and that they're not willing to compromise or negotiate. So if you're dealing with me, just know this is what I stand on. Ah. So Peter is now saying, I'm going to stand on the words that come out of your mouth. So if you say come, that's what I'm standing on. Because that's what my hope, trust, and belief is in. So now, Christians, what do you stand on? You can't stand on your reputation. You can't stand on your bank account. What do I mean by that? It's only the word of God that's going to save your soul. So what do you stand on? He said, unmovable, unshakable. No matter how much wind life throws at me, I'm not, I'm not willing. I got this from Sahili. I'm not willing to negotiate this. I stand on the word. You, I'm not compromising anything. I once heard that American Christianity is watered down. What do we stand on? Hmm? What will we not compromise and negotiate? What am I going to stand on? Even if it brings persecution, even if it brings hatred, even if it brings suffering, what am I going to stand on? Somebody once said, if you don't stand for nothing, you will fall for anything. What do you stand on? We got a problem. I recognize this with Peter. I, I connected with Peter on this too. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked or worshiped on the water to go to Jesus. That's a hallelujah good time right there. Look at the next verse, 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. What happened? Peter! Oh my, you did run well. Peter, what happened? Peter, I was just bragging and preaching on you, playboy. What happened? Okay. Here, I also connected with Peter because I'm human, bro. I'm flawed. Peter, in the midst of his amazement, in the midst of his worship, oh my goodness, in the midst of his worship to God, somehow began to 
What, the, what they doing over there? What you just say? Who they talking about over there? In the midst of his worship, he let the natural overpower the supernatural. The supernatural is the word of God that gave you power to walk on this water and already told you don't be afraid. But now you see this wind, that wind been there. That wind was there when you stepped out the boat. Oh my goodness. They been talking about you. They were talking about you before you became a Christian. Peter, what are you doing, man? Watch how Jesus lightly checks him a couple of verses down. Don't get distracted with the cares of life and take your eyes off the supernatural and take your eyes off the one who can save you. And I'm not just talking about your physical eyes. I'm talking about your mindset. Peter, why do you care about this wind when the one who created it just said, come? Dude, you are already standing on my word through your faith and trust in me. Why are you looking at anything else? Why are you tripping on anything else? I'm right here in front of you. How is it that that has your attention? What is that, Charles? Whatever takes your attention off the word of God. Check this out. <laughs> the wind of life is going to be trying to blow us down for the rest of our life. So we might as well get used to the winds and the waves of life trying to knock us down. But I better stay focused on the one who said, hey, come. The whole reason I came to earth was for you to come. Brother Herb, he said, he said, I'm coming back. There's going to be a great sound like a trumpet. And what all that trumpet is really saying, hey, all y'all who've been obedient, come. And you're going to let something in this life, something in this life, stop you from catching that ride? Peter, what are you looking at? Why did you take your eyes off me? I, Peter, I didn't lose my power. I didn't stop being God in flesh. I told you I would never leave you nor forsake you. I know it felt like that, but I'm right here. How do you think you have the strength to still stand? I'm right here. I'm not going to rescue you the way you think I should all the time, but I am right here. Peter, why did you take your focus off me? I'm still God. It is I. I'm still here. Peter got scared of the wind. He said, don't be afraid, partner. I'm here. What has your attention? What has your attention? Watch this. Hey, man, life is rough. I understand that. I know things happen to all of us for no apparent reason, and we do not understand why this has happened to us. That does not mean that God is not with you. That does not mean that God has abandoned you. He says through every adversity, I will give you a way to escape so that you will, will be able to endure it. Escape does not always mean I'm taking the pain away. Escape means I'm in it with you so you will be able to bear it and it will not kill you because I'm here with you. Yeah, them, three, them three Hebrew boys in the fire. This fire ain't going to touch them. Lions all around Daniel. They ain't going to touch him. 
Now, if he would have been like Peter and looked at the wind and looked at them lions and said, oh my, oh my, a lion, a bear. Who knows what would have happened? That's not the story. Here's the problem. I am by no means any type of counselor or therapist. But I once heard someone say, you are not your trauma. That is something that happened to you. You are not it. Uh, your identity is not in your trauma. Because we all got it. But if you wallow in it long enough, Hey, Peter took his eyes off the superpower, the supernatural, and he began to sink. <sighs> if we spend too much time in misery, grief, and trauma, where do you think the term drowning in your misery comes from? Peter began to sink because that's what he was focused on. If that's all I'm focused on, you will get lost in that. And he said, wait a minute, no, no, come, come out of that. That's what I'm here for. Only for a brief moment. It don't take long for you to take your mind off Christ. It don't take long before you're drowning in something. <sighs> I'm not making light of nobody's trauma. But understand, God says, there is no adversity that has come upon you that is not common to humanity. He's not saying that's normal what's happening to you specifically. But what he's saying is, I've been dealing with human beings since Adam and Eve. And whatever's happening to you, I've seen it before. I will conquer it as long as you trust me. So there's nothing you're going through that I can't handle. That is what that text is saying. Because the very next phrase says, but God is faithful. But do I believe that? Or do I want to stay comfortable? I know it hurts. Imagine preaching this at a funeral when it's fresh. I know it hurts. But if my focus is on Jesus... I'll just continue to worship. The pain didn't go any. Peter, he never said the waves stopped and the wind stopped, did he? No, no. He just said, hey, bro, come. The storm is still happening. Those other boys, he's, all his disciples is in this boat. You don't hear a word from them. You don't hear a word. Peter, Peter steps out and starts walking. Them boys still in the boat, still think he's walking to a ghost probably. Peter, oh my goodness. The storm didn't stop, bro. What's the point? God is not going to always make it stop. He's not going to always take the pain away. He's not going to always take the suffering away. But what he will do is say, hey, hide in me. And you will be able to endure it when you trust in me. If you try to make human logic out of this, you're going to drown yourself. Because it does not make sense. But you have to trust me. Okay. Jesus dying on the cross, an innocent, never sinned person, dying for people who hate him does not make human logical sense. So then, Naman, when I, when I understand that and I say, God, why me? Yeah, Christ could have said that too. As a matter of fact, he was crying to God saying, mm, is there another way we can do this? Because my humanity is kicking in like, woo, you sure you want me to go do this? It made no human logical sense. So that's why the scripture says, we have not such a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities because he can sympathize with when we say, this don't make no sense. 
But my Savior can say, I understand, Charles. I know it doesn't. Imagine how I felt on my way to the cross. Where's my trust? The pain's not going to always go away. Please, please don't allow yourself and myself to drown in misery, to drown in depression, to drown in trauma, to drown in addiction, to drown in the sin of this world. Because as soon as you do know <laughs> that your trauma, your addiction, the difficulties of life can become your God. Because that then is all that you focus on. And when it becomes all that you focus on, what you are then saying is, God does not have the power to pull me out of this. And God is saying, oh, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God's power will never be diminished. But you then, I don't even know how to say this. Your lack of faith in God holds back him from working in your life in a miraculous way because I don't believe. My doctor, Dr. Adams, just said, hey, hey, Lord, I believe. <laughs> but every now and then, this thing gets so rough out here, help the spaces where I began to doubt. Watch what Peter did. Verse 30, but when he saw the winds boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink and drown, he cried, saying, Lord, there you go again, <laughs> Lord, save me. Take this to your friends and family who say, I'm waiting to get my life together before I come to Jesus. Peter had just lost faith in the one he was focused on. And when he saw himself in a hopeless predicament, getting ready to drown, he cried out, Lord, save me. And the next verse say, Jesus stretched out his hand. <laughs> Jesus ain't petty like you and me. You understand what I'm saying? He ain't fickle like you and me. Because we would have let Peter drown. I tried to help you. You didn't want my help. I'm good. Don't call on me now. Y'all know how we are. We cut. There's people who are cut off in our life right now. Peter screams immediately. Lord, save me. This is now hope for me and you also. How is that? Because when we think we are too dirty to be saved, we can look at when Peter doubted Jesus to his face and then he cried out, Lord, save me. Don't ever let your pride cause you to not cry out. In your filthiest condition, he's still waiting. I died to save you from that filth. Just call me. I'm right here. Don't ever think. See, that's a part of the devil's plan, too. That guilt and shame and embarrassment will eat you alive. To where we begin to think, man, God don't want me. Don't nobody want me. All you got to do is cry out. All right. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith. Wherefore didst thou doubt? That's a light rebuke. He didn't even get on him the way we would have got on him. You know how we get on our kids when they make a mistake? 
and we unleash on them. He didn't even get on him like that. He just said, hey, oh, you of little faith. It was almost like a chuckle. Like, mm, you, you still don't understand who I am. Huh? Oh, what? Peter, why you doubt? Why did you doubt? What happened, man? I thought we were locked in. Why did you doubt? Oh, you of little faith. You know what? That's defined as spoken by the Lord to believers as a gentle rebuke for anxiety. Mm. Yeah. Good yeah. Good word, Don't be anxious for nothing. Yeah. He said that. He says to Peter, what you got all this anxiety for? I'm here. There's no room for your anxiety when you have faith in me. All right, I got to let y'all go. Why did you doubt? That doubt, you know what that doubt, that doubt was, was, was <laughs> that doubt was in reflection of the waves that he was in. Because the wave was doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So this word doubt says, why did you allow yourself to be pulled in two different directions? Yeah. Mm. What influences you? I love Jesus, but I also love that. And he says, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> Make a choice. I love God, but I love this too. He says, why did you, that when he says, oh, you have little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you let yourself go back and forth like that? Like these waves we standing on. I'm standing on what I don't want you to do. Go back and forth. A double-minded man is a, bro, what did your mother tell you? Show me how you do one thing. I'll show you how to do everything. Did she just say that? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's biblical. So if you double-minded with your faith in Christ, what else are you double-minded with? Don't let double-mindedness become a habit and a practice. To where no one can depend on you. Because you're always. Jesus said make a choice. And he told people. Hey you better count the cost. You want to come with me. Yeah. Alright man. We got to get out of here. And when they were coming to the ship. The wind ceased. And they that were in the ship. Came and worshipped him. <laughs> now they worship him. <laughs> Look at when the rest of them worshipped. Look at when the rest of them worshipped. When everything was calm. That is what we call a fair weather friend. <laughs> Peter was the only one that got out the boat. When he was in the midst of a storm. But now that the water's flat. The wind is gone. Now you want to worship. Mm. He didn't rebuke them, but I took note of that. <laughs> oh, now that you're comfortable. Oh, now God is good. Now the storm is over. Now God is good. He was good in the middle of your trauma. This is what we call compassion. Jesus understands that you got to give people room to develop. Amen. Huh? I like Peter now because I understand him. Because remember, Jesus going to tell him later on, hey, Peter, when you convert it, because you ain't there yet. But when you are converted, then I'm going to need you to strengthen the people. But right now, partner, you still, you, you, you know what I mean? We'll get there. But I, I gave you the keys. So when you're converted, right. use them. Amen. So what you going to choose, people? The natural or the supernatural? Come on. Heaven or earth? Creation or the creator? Humanity or God? Faith or fear? 
spiritual or carnal? What will be your choice? And yes, God does have compassion. God does have grace. God does have mercy. But if you are in the condition of going back and forth, if you are in the condition of, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. If you are in the condition of, man, I'm ready to give my life to God, but I got to work this out. Understand, just cry out right now. Do you know that crying can be done silently? Do you know a walk down this aisle is a cry out to God? So I'm ready, bro. If you're in a condition where you have not been washed, cleansed by the blood of Christ, now's the opportunity. I'm not going to run through those five steps because I will be here another hour. Because I would want you to clearly understand this. Please pull us to the side and we can have the conversation of what it means to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. What it means for you to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. What it means for you to confess that you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and he is the son of God. And what it means for you to make a decision and say, I don't want to try to control this by myself no more. Man. I want to do like Peter did and say, and call you Lord, Man. master of my life, and I will follow whatever you say. And I want to have the choice to repent and say, I don't want to go this way no more, but I want to follow you. There's some water back here in the box. We will bury you in this water so all your sins will be washed away. The Holy Spirit of God will fill you up. You will be a new creature in Christ. Together we stand and sing. Amen.